Ani, Jiaoning here, and welcome to my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. For the next 25 days, I'm going to create 25 videos highlighting Indigenous people's culture, history, languages, and identities. And so, let's not waste any time. Let's talk about Indigenous peoples and our relationship to the holiday season. You might have noticed that I'm calling this series a holiday calendar and not an advent calendar. And that's because Indigenous peoples come from a wide range of spiritualities and many like myself don't practice or identify with the Catholic or Christian religion. But many of us still celebrate the holidays. Why? For one, we do have our own holiday this month, which is the winter solstice, but we'll learn all about that one later. When our children were being taken and forced to attend residential and boarding schools, the residential schools were operated by the church and were often very far from communities. And it was the Christmas holidays that children would be given an opportunity to go home and spend time with their families. And based on that children's behavior and even their parents' behavior, kids could be kept at school and denied time with their family. Since then, many of us spread holiday cheer by spending time with family, exchanging gifts, and just eating good food. Miigwech for watching, and don't forget to like and follow so you don't miss another video, and comment down below what you'd like to learn about Indigenous peoples this holiday season. Miigwech. Ani Zhaoning here, and welcome to day two of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. And on day two, what a beautiful morning to get all this snow last night. So I couldn't pick a more fitting morning to talk about uh, the month of December. As Anishinaabe people, we call or refer to the moon or the month of December as Minidogizis. And Minidogizis uh, translates to uh, spirit moon. And the reason we call it spirit moon is because this time of year is when Babonake, that spirit of the winter, comes down and blankets the earth with snow. And what that tells us is that this is now a safe time for us to share stories and to talk about certain spirits and beings that we can't talk about throughout the year. And that's because those beings and a lot of spirits will actually rest uh, during the winter months. And so it's safe for us to talk about them without worrying of calling them down or distracting them from the work that they're supposed to do. So the winter months are our time for stories and our time for telling those stories of those beings. And so with this beautiful blanket of snow, that's signal to us that it's safe to do so. And we can start doing that right up until the springtime. So, miigwech for watching. Don't forget to like and follow so you don't miss another video. And I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here and welcome to day three of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Yesterday, I had the privilege of speaking with a group who's committed to protecting Trent lands and it had me thinking, why is the land so sacred to us and what is our connection to the land? For me, I go all the way back to our creation story, our Anishinaabe creation story. When it came time to creating us, the creator took a piece of the earth, a piece of clay from the earth, and he sculpted it into the most beautiful image that he could. And when he was satisfied with that image, he took that image and he blew his sacred breath of life into that image and we were born. What's important to know is that we were not created in the image of our creator. If you want to know what the creator looks like, all you have to do is step outside and admire the natural world. We and the natural world, we are the physical manifestation of our creator's thoughts. But because we are all quite literally created from the earth, that all makes us children of the earth. It makes us all related. And we carry with us every day a spirit and a breath that comes from Gajam and our creator. Chimigwech for watching. Don't forget to like and follow if you enjoyed this video and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here and welcome to day four of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Today, I wanna to talk about my Indigenous pedagogy to teaching and learning. Yesterday, I shared such a small piece of our Anishinaabek creation story. And if I were to share the full thing with you, it could take days. And besides, I don't know the full story in its entirety, nor do I have the permissions to share it. I have a saying, if you approach an elder with a question, you'll often leave with more questions. And that's my approach to teaching. It's like, they don't even teach you anything. Just expect you to know. Yeah, that's the native way of teaching. We have this uh, traditional pedagogy of a uh, just get out there and learn, fucker. Ugh. We believe that you are the conductor of your own learning and learning should be lifelong and taken slow. We need to know when it's time to walk and not run because if you sprint towards what you desire most, you'll miss what's been laid out in front of you. I share so little as to not fill your cup or smother your fire. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here and welcome to day five of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Babon is our Anishinaabe word for the season of winter, and it's in that word Babon that is the teaching of slowing down and stopping. Also in the winter do our lakes and rivers slow down almost to a stop. As Anishinaabe, we view our Mother Earth, our Shkakamikwa, as a living, breathing entity like you or I. And what happens to our bodies when we rest? Our bodies cool down and our heart rate slows. Our lakes and our rivers are the veins and the lifeblood of our Mother Earth, and she too needs time to rest. Remember that not all beings of creation live the go-go lifestyle that we do. Take a lesson from the natural world and slow down. Take care of yourself. 
Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Jiaoning here and welcome to day six of my indigenous knowledge holiday calendar. Our winter months here in Canada are some of our harshest and I've had lots of people in my comment section asking me what our life looked like in the winter. I shared how our winter months are our time for stories and while that's very spiritual it's also incredibly practical because our winter months are very much a time for survival. During the winter months our communities would spread out and our families would move to their winter trapping camps. Our families relied heavily on food stores like our meat harvested in the fall, our maple sugar harvested in the early spring, and our minomen, our wild rice harvest. And then our food would be supplemented throughout the winter by our trap line and our fish nets. And our higher caloric foods like our maple sugars were often saved for the later months of the winter if food was looking scarce. We are very busy people throughout the year, but sometimes our winter months can be slow and boring. To avoid this boredom, many of our people practiced our crafts in the winter time. And we played lots of games like the game Snow Snake. Snow Snake is where you carve a piece of wood to be tossed down a trough made out of snow, trying to get as far as you can. Miigwech for watching. Don't forget if you enjoyed this video to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here, and welcome to day seven of my Indigenous Knowledge holiday calendar. Today is special because today is our seventh day, and I couldn't have picked a better day to share with you a little bit about our seven grandfather teachings. One of our major goals as Anishinaabek while navigating through this physical world is to live what's called Minobamadzawin. And Minobamadzawin is our way of describing the good life or a good life. And we have an ancient story of how seven grandfather spirits came to our people with seven teachings to help us live in that good way. These are those teachings. The teaching of Debwewin, truth, not only just talks about sounding the truth, but to be true to ourselves. The teaching of Daba Senzawin, humility, teaches us to think outside of ourselves. The teaching of Ma Jidwin, respect, teaches us to respect all things in creation and to go easy on one another, to be gentle. The teaching of Zagidwin, love, it's self-explanatory. It means to have unconditional love for all of creation. The teaching of Gweok Wadzuin, honesty, means not only to be honest, but to live honestly and correctly. The teachings of Zongo de Ewin, courage, tells us to be brave, but not brave from the mind, but to have courage from the heart. The teaching of Nibwa Kawin, wisdom, means to live with all of these teachings. These seven grandfather teachings are some of our most widely shared teachings from Anishinaabek knowledge. And if you want to learn more about them, they're easily accessible online. Miigwech for watching. Don't forget if you enjoyed this video to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. I think I like this little life. This little life I think I like this little life This silly little life Eyes Smiling over candles Ani Zhaoning here and welcome to day 9 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar you ever been to a powwow and seen what feels like endless booths of indigenous artists selling their craft? Well, today, I want to share with you what the significance can be of that indigenous art. Indigenous peoples by nature are very creative and artistic peoples. And when it comes to physical objects, you're often receiving more than just a beaded earring or a necklace. Let me explain. You see, for us, making something can be seen as a ceremony. For us in Anishinaabe, we believe spirit travels through our hands. So when we create things, we're putting a piece of ourselves into that object. Many indigenous artists have healed from generations of trauma by processing grief and channeling it into the object as they work on it. So next time you question the prices at powwows, remember that you're paying for an extension of that artist. That's also why indigenous art is so diverse and expressive because every single bead, every single stitch tells a story. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here and welcome to day 10 of my indigenous knowledge holiday calendar. Today I want to talk about treaties. Did you know that your existence here in Canada is only made possible because of the countless treaties between Indigenous peoples and the Indigenous peoples and local federal governments? Treaties are legal binding agreements that set out the responsibilities, rights, and relationships of the local First Nations and the provincial and federal governments. But why are treaties important to you, you might ask? Well, it's because we're all treaty people. You see, treaties represent our mutual relationship and our commitment to one another. And this relationship that you might be finding out just now that you're a part of comes with an obligation of knowing and upholding one's treaty obligations and rights. And not every treaty will be between the First Peoples and the local governments. We have treaties between nations that predate colonization. For example, we have the Dish with 
one spoon treaty also known as the dish with many ladles treaty and this represents the mutual harvesting rights and land access of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people that stretches along the Great Lakes in the St. Lawrence region and that treaty had ceremony conducted for it in 1701. So remember, we're all treaty people and when living in Canada, it's your responsibility to know your treaties and to know your obligations within them. Miigwech for watching. If you're interested in learning more about treaties, there's links in my bio. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani, Johnny here and welcome to day 11 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Hey, are you native? I am. Sick. Can I get a blessing? Aho. Oh, creator, I want to offer a real sacred blessing to this young man. Today, let's talk about why Indigenous humor and laughter is so important to us as Indigenous peoples. For many Indigenous nations, laughter is actually seen as a form of medicine. And by making someone laugh, you're actually helping them heal. For us as Anishinaabe people, we make a joke about how laughter and humor is our fifth sacred medicine. Oftentimes when we gather before we get so serious, we'll oftentimes spread jokes and spread laughter. And that's because it helps us open up. It helps us get comfortable in a space. And it's a teaching to not take everything so seriously all the time. What's going on? I'm done. Cut the show. Laughter has helped our people get through some dark times and it helps us not feel so alone in this world if people are sharing jokes that only our people would understand. Humor is so widely used in our communities for its ability to heal and bring people together. Our comedians aren't just clowns but healers and community builders too. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani, Jianning here and welcome to day 12 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Wow, we're halfway there. I couldn't be happier with how this video series is going. And in response to an influx of new followers, I want to ask you these 12 questions. Do you call yourself an ally? Do you respect our inherent rights? Do you honor our individuality? Do you recognize and support us as a sovereign people? Do you support your local Indigenous communities? Are you sharing our truths with your family and friends? Do you support Indigenous creators and business? Are you exercising your privilege for good? Are you doing the best you can while being conscious of the space you take up? Do you protect and fight for our missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit? Are you making it a goal to foster healthier relationships with Indigenous peoples? And will you stand up for us when no one is watching? Remember that being an ally is a privilege that we give to you. It defines what you do, but not who you are. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani, Jianning here, and welcome to day 13 of my Indigenous Knowledge holiday calendar. Being day 13, I couldn't pick a better day to talk about our 13 moons calendar. Everyone's familiar with the Gregorian calendar that we use today, but us as Nishinaabe, we use the winters to mark our years past and the 13 moon cycles as our yearly calendar. Every year we have 13 moon cycles and 28 days in between every new moon. And us as Nishinaabe people, we have given names to those moons for what we do that time of year. Our third moon, for example, around the time of March time is Zizboktoke Agizis. And Zizboktoke Agizis means maple sugar moon. And that moon for us marks the end of the winter season, the mark of the new year, and the running of the maple water. And our women too have 13 menstrual cycles every year and conduct ceremony every full moon to honor their connection to the moon, which we also refer to as our grandmother. If you need more convincing, our 13 moon cycle is also expressed on the back of the turtle. If you look at the shell of a turtle, you'll see that there are 28 scoots on the exterior of the turtle and 13 scoots on the inside, marking our 13 moons and our 28 day cycles. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani, Jianning here and welcome to day 14 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. I want to offer some advice for my Indigenous folks. It's our belief that before being lowered to this world, we sit down with Bijam and Ado, our creator, and we map out our life. We can see the whole life laid out in front of us, everything that'll happen to us, everything that we'll achieve, and we even choose the parents that we'll have. And knowing all of that, we still choose this life and we still choose to be lowered down here. So remember, if times are getting tough or if somebody's telling you that your skin isn't dark enough or your hair isn't black enough and your eyes aren't brown enough, that we're all lowered here with a gift and with a message. And if you lead a good life and if you persevere, that gift or that message will show itself to you. In our ceremonies, we always teach people how to walk and not run. Because if we're always running towards and reaching towards what it is we desire most, we'll lose sight of where we actually are and what we're meant to do. But if you have faith and you follow your teachings and you lead a good life, then what is meant for you will come to you in the time that is most right for you. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow.
Ani Jiang here and welcome to day 15 of my indigenous knowledge holiday calendar. The western world needs to take indigenous perspectives seriously, especially with the climate crisis going on. In recent videos, I refer to the natural world, our mother earth, the moon, the waters, as living breathing entities like you or I. They have animacy, they're living. And when the world's fighting over how to save the environment, the people you need to listen to are indigenous peoples. Because it's the indigenous nations of the world that protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And when that environment is treated and respected as equals to us, no one knows better how to interact with and protect the natural world. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here, and welcome to day 16 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Did you know that more than 60% of all self-identified or registered Indigenous peoples in Canada exist outside of reservations? In fact, we live in all spaces, and our territories expand far outside the colonial boundaries of local reservations. Miigwech for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here, and welcome to day 17 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. It's been raining all day in my part of Anishinaabek territory, so let's talk about it. The Anishinaab Bamoan word that we use to describe it is raining is gimme one. Gimme one. Gimme one as your way buck go jing. And on days like today, I used to always be annoyed and frustrated that I couldn't go outside, I couldn't do anything. And when I began connecting more to my teachings and going back to ceremonies, I grew a new appreciation for the rains. You see, our rains bring us fresh and clean nibbe. Nibbe, our source of life, that fresh, clean water. And remember that if the rain isn't for us, that it's a gift for someone else and that the rains bring medicines. And don't feel down on yourself if you're feeling uninspired on days like today. We're meant to be inside with our families. The rains are much like our teachings of winter, that it's okay to stand still. The next time it rains, go outside and say miigwech, thank you. We as Nishnabek have ceremony and songs that we sing to show gratitude to the rain. So you too can have your own little ceremony and go outside and say miigwech, thank you. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow. And tomorrow we're talking about land acknowledgements. So I'll see you then. I'm getting inside. <laughs> Ani, Johnny here. Welcome to day 18 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. I'd like to humbly acknowledge that we live and conduct work on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. And we thank them for taking care of this land. Land acknowledgements. We've heard them all. In the last 10 years, in the recent trends of truth and reconciliation, land acknowledgements have been a way for Canadians to acknowledge us. In a way, I think, to reverse the invisibility of our people. Land acknowledgements, when done right, can share our recent commitments and educate people about our local first peoples or remind people of our treaty relations. What a land acknowledgement isn't is a one-off sentence to check a box, an opportunity to boast a relationship, or a dull, non-personal copy and paste statement written by somebody else. All too often do Indigenous peoples roll their eyes at land acknowledgements. So if you're going to make a land acknowledgement, make it personal, make it accurate, and make it a commitment. And remember that your actions will always speak for your land acknowledgement. So tell me, if you're Indigenous, do we ditch the land acknowledgements or do we reapproach them? Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaoning here and welcome to day 19 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Orality is a method of knowledge transmission through the use of our voice. Orality has been a major catalyst for knowledge transmission and storytelling for my people, the Anishinaabe, for time immemorial. But that isn't to say that orality and storytelling has been our only form of knowledge transmission. We have song, dance, ceremony, art, performance, and even written. When I was a teenager, I had a gentleman try to discredit Indigenous knowledge by telling me that it's like the game Broken Telephone. What I believe this man was trying to accomplish was saying that when Indigenous peoples only shared stories or only shared our culture with language, that that language can be distorted and changed over time, losing the original story. When you whisper a nonsensical phrase into somebody's ears, it has no substance, it has no spirit, it has no meaning. But the stories we share as Nishinaabe people are no nonsensical phrases. They are perfectly crafted stories that have taken an elder or knowledge keeper countless years to fully come to understand and learn how to tell. But our stories have spirit, and different storytellers will share different versions of that story based on how that story has impacted their life. In our culture, we'll often hear a story sometimes hundreds of times, but each time we hear that story, we'll take something new and add it to our knowledge of that story. Devaluing our culture because we didn't write it in books is a form of genocide. Our culture is so much spiritual as it is physical, and so much of our storytelling is spiritual. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow.
Ani Johnning here and welcome to day 20 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Today I want to share with you some of my favorite books from my Indigenous library. I can't seem to find my copy, but if you're a non-Indigenous person in Canada and interested in learning about the Indigenous and Canadian relationship throughout Canada's history, then you need to read the book 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act by Bob Joseph. Definitely check out one of our local writers here in the Peterborough area is Leanne Simpson, Lighting the Eighth Fire and As We Have Always Done Our Great Books. Another local writer and a late elder and teacher of myself is Doug Williams or Gidega Megaze. He has the book uh, Michisagi, This Is Our Territory. Uh, if you're interested in learning about the history of my local people, the Mississauga Ojibwe's. If you're into indigenous fiction, we have The Marrow Thieves and Firekeeper's Daughter. I actually haven't read either of these books, but I've read a couple chapters from Firekeeper's Daughter. Embedded within Firekeeper's Daughter is a whole bunch of our culture and our ceremony that's embedded within a fictional story. Basically, any one of these books that have the CBC Massey Lecture Series, any one of these authors' books are excellent reads. So for example, Thomas King's The Truth About Stories, excellent read. We had to read this one in school, as well as Tanya Talega's All Our Relations, excellent book. If you're interested in learning some Anishinaabe ceremony, uh, the Mishomas book is an excellent one, as well as basically any book written from Basil Johnson. And finally, if you're interested in learning some Indigenous knowledge of the land, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass is a must read, as well as Gregory Cajete's Native Science. While I was editing, I also forgot to mention that if you're interested in learning about Indigenous approaches to Western education, then you have to look up my mom's work, Dr. Nicole Bell. That's all I got with me here today, but if you've got some great book selections, don't forget to drop them in the comment section below. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow. And tomorrow is our winter solstice, so I'll see you then. Ani Johnning here and welcome to day 21 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Today is our winter solstice and our winter solstice is that unique time of year that when here on Turtle Island, our Michelle Mesquizas, our grandfather's son, spends the least amount of time with us. For us, it's a celebration and a reflection on the changing of the seasons and it's a time to honor the cycles, the patterns, the flow of life, the cosmos and all of creation. The natural world and the cosmos are our classroom and its beings have taught us how life moves and interconnects. In fact, we Anishinaabe have words to describe parts of the cosmos that only Western science is just discovering. The winter solstice is a time of darkness and it teaches us to go into the deepest parts of ourselves, to reflect on and identify our intentions and to take care of the spiritual part of ourselves. It's often a day used for ceremony and healing to prepare our spirit for the coming year. Our winter solstice is celebrated in so many ways, but what is always practiced is feasting and spending time with our families. Our winter solstice is a powerful time of year, so don't forget to take care of yourself, rejuvenate, recharge your senses to the natural world, and offer your gratitude to Michelle Mesquizas, our grandfather's son, for offering us life each and every day. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and follow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaning here and welcome to day 22 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. One of the things that I've spent a great deal of time on is understanding Indigenous masculinities, what it means to be a man. Because what would have been traditional methods to understanding and learning manlyhood are very inaccessible today due to colonization. But let me begin by saying that sexism, misogyny, and homophobia have never been a part of our teachings as men. And if you encounter those in our communities today, they are the result of colonization and the belief system that was forced on us in residential and boarding schools. But we do have gender specific roles within our community and ceremonies. But if you enter those spaces with a Western colonial lens, you won't allow yourself to see our spirituality for what it is, which is a beautiful and equal balance of our men, women, and two spirit people. So back to masculinity, we refer to many of our men as what's called Ogicha Da, our warriors. To be called an Ogicha Da today doesn't mean that you're some fearless warrior. Well, maybe sometimes when we're protecting our lands, but it means you're a protector. It means you're a community builder, it means you're a leader, a role model, a father. But it's in our Anishinaabe culture that our men eat last at the feast. It's our men who seek counsel from the grandmothers. But remember, we're not perfect and we're still very much in a time of revitalizing those old teachings. Miigwech for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Zhaning here and welcome to day 23 of my Indigenous Knowledge Holiday Calendar. Behind me here on the lake that I grew up on, on the lake that I live on here in Nishinaabad Territory, the ice is forming and the ice is starting to come in. And two days ago, we just had our winter solstice celebration. And for us Anishinaabe, the winter solstice is a signal, it's a marker for us to start our stories. And of course, not all stories can only be told in the winter time, but we have certain figures and certain beings that we can only talk about when there's snow on the ground and when winter has started and when we've had our winter solstice. For example, one of those beings 
is our trickster character Nana Bojo. Us as Nishinabe, we only share Nana Bojo stories when snow has fallen and winter solstice has happened. And that's because we believe as Nishinabe, every single thing that we look at in the natural world has a Nana Bojo story because it was one of Nana Bojo's instructions by the creator to travel the world and to name everything, to learn what everything's gift is. So now is a safe time to share those stories because the things that Nanda Bojo traveled and learned about are now resting during this time. So we're not distracting them from their work and we're not distracting Nana Bojo. And we have lots of stories that aren't cultural or aren't spiritual in any way, but they're just to support children's development. For example, the ice that forms on the lake, we don't want our children in the winter running out on the ice and risking falling through. So we have stories that we tell our children that they can only go out on the ice when they're with an adult because there's monsters that live under the ice that'll get them if they go out by themselves. That's all for today. Wanted to share with you a little bit about what our winter stories look like. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and follow and I'll see you tomorrow. Ani Johnny here. Welcome to day 24 of my Indigenous Knowledge holiday calendar. Today's the final day of my holiday calendar. So I want to send you off on this. Between 2007 and 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada traveled across Canada for six years and gathered first-hand accounts of what happened in residential and boarding schools. They asked survivors to relive their trauma so that we could have a first-hand historical record of what happened in the residential school system. And in 2015, the TRC delivered their report along with 94 calls to action to the city of Ottawa. It has been eight years since the TRC has created the calls to action and only 13 of the 94 have been implemented. So this past month, I've given you so much. And so it's your turn now to give back as well. Read the report, study the calls to action, and take truth and reconciliation into your own hands. And I better not see any comments blaming the big guy in Ottawa because this is Canada's problem. Miigwech for joining me for the last 24 days. This won't be the last time you hear or learn from me, but this is the end of my holiday series. Join me tomorrow for some final reflections, but until then, I'll see you later. Miigwech.